Okay, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Cheryl Woodruff. I'm the Community Development Director for the Washington Square Park Conservancy. Uh, for those of you who were with us last week, uh, this is the second part of a talk by the lovely and knowledgeable Emily Keyes Fulp. Uh, it happened on Washington Square. It is based on her book of the same name. Uh, it is not regularly in print, but I have found copies uh, at the Strand and used through Amazon as well, um, as well as at other local bookshops. So if you would like to get that, it is out there, um, particularly in the village. Um, Emily is a trustee of the Washington Square Park Conservancy, and she is an art historian. And I think I particularly love this talk because uh, I'm not super, <laughs> I'm not super uh, educated on a lot of the artists uh, of the neighborhood and there were many who made their home uh, in the village and really through their art really captured the, what the square kind of meant and, um, and uh, showed like how it was in people's lives. So I think Emily does a great job of bringing these uh, pictures to life for those of us who did not study uh, art history. Um, I am very happy we, we wanted to do this this year in person. We have done this lecture in the past with our greeter volunteers. We wanted to open it up to a wider audience of conservancy donors. I wish we were in person together and we could have had a glass of wine or some cheese or, you know, could have talked afterwards, but um, we will open it up for questions at the end. Um, and uh, um, you, you can use either the chat function um, or the Q and A box. I will be monitoring both. Um, and I am going to go dark, so don't get worried when my face goes away, but I want you to concentrate on Emily and have enough screen so you can see the wonderful photos that she's showing. So without further ado, Emily, welcome. Thank you for part two of It Happened on Washington Square. Thank you, thank you, Cheryl. Uh, hello, everyone, thank you for joining me. We're gonna be talking tonight about Washington Square in the 20th century, but I will already issue a caveat. Um, the, we're going to be getting about as far up as maybe two thirds of the way uh, to the time when the park was closed to traffic. But I'm also going to indulge in a practice that many has done, and that is we're going to go back for a few minutes before we go ahead. Emily, I'm sorry, this is Cheryl. I'm just, um, I'm getting a little bit of interference. I think maybe um, you might be hitting something on the computer occasionally. Um, okay. All right, no. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> okay great, thank right. you. Thank sorry you. about that. So I'm going back to that time when the parade ground was what we know now as the park. Um, and you can see the square on the east side known as the row. Um, the parade ground was established on the site of the um, Potter's Field, which was in place from 1797 to 1825, um, where it held the bodies of the yellow fever victims. Um, and when it filled up, the Common Council, the ruling body of the city, decided it should be a parade ground. Now that parade ground was inaugurated with great fanfare in, on July 4th, 1826. It so happens that that was about a year after the Erie Canal opened. And that Erie Canal really helped make New York's future and made New York a kind of commercial character, uh, the, the commercial capital. Um, with the wealth of the canal, which, with all the goods and services, the goods coming through from the heartland across the middle of New York State and down the Hudson River to the port of New York, a lot of businessmen became very prosperous. And as Henry James described, that when the murmur of trade had become a mighty uproar, the wealthier residents left the clamor of Wall Street for quiet uptown. And it so happened some of those prosperous men had also um, found a way to get hold of the land along the north side of the square where they developed uh, this very beautiful Greek revival row of townhouses. There is another row of more individual houses, as you know, on the north side toward the west. 
These houses were a very elegant enclave. They welcomed the wealthy. And it's important just to remember how splendid it must have been to live on Washington Square in the 1830s and 40s. Um, there were many exciting things happening then. Um, there was a uh, NYU was established. There were artists coming into the area. Um, uh, Samuel, B. Samuel Morse um, invented and first demonstrated his telegraph, which uh, in the square, which helped make New York be a communications capital. And so it was quite a lively spot. But as we always see with New York, things will change. And as people moved up, we know that by 1841, well, it, by 1841, 180 of the 200 wealthiest individuals in New York lived below 14th Street. By 1851, more of those people had moved up to the 20s. And by a little bit after that, we know that people were living at equal numbers above 14th and below. Some of those numbers were growing because of immigrants, the first wave of immigrants coming in, but it gives us an idea of that ever northward march, that shift of population. And this has a lot to do with how Washington Square area and how the park too, how it developed. When the arch was put up, first the temporary arch, of course, and then made into the permanent marble monument you see in that lovely photograph there on the left, um, it was meant to be in some ways an attempt to hold the neighborhood, to, in, to ensure that it would remain um, an elite kind of place. But things really were changing, as we'll see in a moment. The arch and then the, the view that you see on the right by Child Hostum of Washington Square in the spring, 1892, it may actually be 1893, he may have dated it earlier. At any rate, there you see the effect of what Hassam and what many of the people in the city were trying to do. This was the time of the city beautiful movement when erecting an arch or any monument in neoclassical style would uh, impart a certain grandeur, a certain sense of stability. Um, and this was happening all through the city. The arch was finished in the 90s. A few years later, we get Grand Central Station um, and the Penn Railroad, the New York Public Library. All of those are wonderful buildings that embody the principles of the city beautiful. However, there wasn't much that could be done to hold back the changes that were sweeping through the city. We had seen this painting by Fernand Lundgren, The Winter Wedding on Washington Square of 1897. It was a wedding of one of the daughters of a man who had grown up, spent his whole life on Washington Square, Edward Taylor, and he would have lived a few closer to the arch, a few doors down from where the, the viewer is standing here. Um, the picture was a wonderful record of a special event, December 16, 1896, um, when we know that his daughter married and the Shermhorns and the Astors and the Havemeyers and all of New York came uh, to this special event. But at the same time, just two years earlier actually, we see that there were changes happening in the square. This drawing appeared in Century Magazine in 1894, um, a city tramp at work. There were a lot of people in the square who would bother the ladies and gentlemen, mostly the ladies, I guess, who are more vulnerable. You can see two standing back near the square, looking as if they're hungry and forlorn, maybe needing some money. Um, so this was already happening in the 1890s. A woman who had actually grown up on Washington Square and then married and moved to 9th Street, Mariana Griswold von Rensselaer, was a reporter. And she um, wrote something that appeared in Century Magazine. She said, they are not the fashionable streets they were in my childhood, but good people, in quotes, still live in them. So we see that um, people then were very much aware of the changes. And yet, like William Rhinelander Stewart and others, people did stay, they did stay uh, close to the square. 
but things were changing. Many of the individual houses, things were changing in the area. As more and more immigrants were coming to New York, they began to move in to what had once been single family residences that were then turned into tenements. And they were crowded in all the way and they were living through, from coming up from the area around City Hall, pushing through what we know of not just the Lower East Side, but also through uh, NoHo, through parts of what we would describe as the South Village and SoHo. You may be familiar with the cast iron buildings that go up in SoHo. Well, a lot of those had taken the place. They supplanted the early fine residential housing that was, in, was there, very similar to what we have in the village. And instead, these cast iron buildings were commercial lofts. There were lofts like that that went up east of the square. And one of those lofts was the Ash Building, and that was where the Triangle Fire took place on March 25th in 1911. Um, it is an event that really tells us what was happening, and it embodies so much of what was going on now in the city. It pulls together a lot of the issues that um, I've described earlier, the problems of the disparity of income, labor unrest, uh, immigrants um, looking for work or working for very low wages. And we can see here, the one picture on the left shows when the fire was actually going on. Many of the people working in that factory, there were about 600 of them. It was a factory that made the shirt waists or the tops, the blouses that women would wear, working women would wear. And the, the blouses would hang over their, their desks as they were doing the sewing. Probably a cigarette, possibly a cigarette, caught fire with the cloth. The building itself was fireproof. But whatever it was, the fire raged on a Saturday and it trapped many hundreds of people inside. The, um, you can see the hoses of the firemen, but their ladders that went up high, but their ladders didn't reach. And so a good number of the young men, mostly women, um, had to jump. It was a horrifying sight. It changed our feelings and in, then it affected the public's estimation of uh, just some of the labor problems that we faced. And it ushered in a time of the beginnings of reform. One of the witnesses to the fire was Frances Perkins, and she was coming, she'd come to visit a friend on the other side of the square. She looked across and saw this, the fire. Years later, she became Franklin Delano Roosevelt's um, labor secretary, and she felt that this fire had really started a movement that went on and was more fully realized in the New Deal. The number of people who worked there, some did escape, some were helped by some NYU students who stretched ladders across from their building to the main building over to um, the top floor of the factory. But of the many who died, the bodies were laid out in Washington Square and people came in later that day or the next day to inspect and try to find their loved ones. They had had pay stubs in their pockets. Some of them were so badly charred they couldn't even be recognized. On April 5th, there was a funeral that was held for the unidentified. There were seven unidentified victims of the fire. And that procession passed through on a suitably rainy day. Uh, it passed through Washington Square for hours, not only all the, the city agencies and the police and firemen, but also crowds and crowds of mourners. And you can see them there with their dark umbrellas. It was a very, very sober time. And not the happiest note to begin our discussion of the 20th century, but it does show us where we are and what's, what's happening. The issue of labor was a predominant one. And on uh, Labor Day, September 2nd of 1912, many women, and I think there are some men in the group too, gathered together for a major parade um, to champion their cause, to organize uh, for better pay, better working conditions. The, the workers at the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire had actually gone on strike two years earlier. Most of the factory workers at that time who were involved in, in cloth making uh, had also walked out, but it didn't do any good. There hadn't been any changes. And so when that fire came, 
uh, it was almost as if they, the workers knew that something terrible could happen. The other interesting thing is you can still hear, I want before we leave the, um, we can just go back for a minute, the Triangle Fire, every year on March 25th, there is a reading of the names of the people who died. There are plaques on the building. Now you may say, well, wait a minute, the building, the building never came down. It was uh, very sturdily made to be fireproof. Everything in it burned, but the building survived. And why it, it's, stayed as a factory until 1929 when NYU took it over, turned it into classrooms, and it is still used for uh, science and other lab classes. But the issue of labor is going to be one that runs through now a good part of uh, the activity around the square and it will become a cause. Uh, this is a wonderful photo though because it also shows us the parades in Washington Square's arch being used as it has been used in very recent weeks um, where people come marching down Fifth Avenue and find their way to the opening of the central plaza of the park. But there will be a new spirit as well and there's a wonderful change that occurs uh, around the same time as we are talking about the, the fire, um, we also see newcomers coming into the village. And among them was Glackens. William Glackens was an artist from Philadelphia. He came with a number of his friends who had trained to be illustrators. That was a good way to make a living. <clears throat> you might have wanted to paint and, and make pictures to sell, but in order to, to feed your family, you could work as an illustrator. And Glackens was, uh, was fairly successful at that. He came with John Sloan and some others and Robert Henry and came up from Philadelphia and established themselves in New York. This was a group that championed realism. They wanted to show the city as it was, as it looked to them, uh, sometimes messy, a little bit of slush on the ground, sometimes uh, people you know, brawling and you can see the policemen there. Um, so to them, this was a, a very modern approach compared to that painting we just saw by Child Hossam, where the arch looks beautiful, the street is being cleaned, everything is calm and the city is beautiful. Uh, this is a little bit um, more natural, we'd say, a natural view of how it probably looked. Um, then the view there on the right, Glackens, the green car in 1911. Glackens established himself in a studio on the south side of Washington Square, number 50. And he could look right out and see what was happening. And so for a number of years, he's left, he's made a wonderful uh, record of all the activities in the square, the changing seasons, the different weather, and the activities that you can see of the children, the policemen, uh, one kid is shown rubbing his eyes, probably crying, whether from a fight or fall. And you'll also notice all the traffic going through the park, not just the horses, the carriages, the early cars, the bicycles. It's a real scramble, a real scrabble. The drawing that got Glackens made originally was chosen to be on the cover of this Collier's magazine. It was a national magazine. Um, and this cover appeared on April 16th. So we have to realize that, wait a minute, people around the country might have known about Washington Square, or maybe through some pictures would soon learn about the square. Glackens found all sorts of subjects. 1909, he shows us the Italo-American celebration in Washington Square. What were these people doing? We think of our Garibaldi statue, which had gone into the square in 1888. It had been paid for, funded completely by the Italian community, which lived to the south of Washington Square. And they were turning out here for what looks like quite a splendid uh, event to give honor to their hero of the Risorgimento. This new spirit of creativity uh, will really take off in, in the, all these years going up to the First World War. And we'll talk about some of the people and the characters who came and what they found so appealing. On the left is a photograph by Jesse Torbox Beals. It shows Grace Godwin's Garrett and the Oasis of Washington Square. 
uh, and that was a place to get a drink. There's Grace up in her garret up above about to welcome people, perhaps for tea or a snack. That little dwelling on the south side of Washington Square was the original house for the grave digger of the potter's field. And it only came down uh, many years later when other buildings were going up on the south side of the square. On the right is the other end on the south side toward the west, Washington Square south from McDougal um, and across. And you can see the cars in the photo um, so that you know that it's from the 1940s. But this is how it looked way back already um, because many of those houses by 1900, 1905 had turned into tenement buildings or boarding houses. And they were especially welcoming to the young artists and the writers who were coming in to the square. Now, why were they coming? Well, there were several reasons. First of all, New York was becoming a cultural capital. There were a lot of publishing houses where you could publish your poems and books, where you could illustrate some books, you could make illustrations for newspapers as Blackens did and some of his friends did. Um, but also there was something else that was appealing about it. I mentioned all the immigrants. Well, Dejuna Barnes, who lived down there at the time, wrote, why has Washington Square a meaning? of fragrance, so to speak, while Washington Heights has none. Here on the north side are stately houses and all those whose names rustle like silk petticoats. And on the other side, conjuries of houses and hovels passing into rabbit warrens, where Italians breathe and swarm in the sun as in Naples, where vegetables and fruits are sold in the streets and ice cream is made in the bedroom and spaghetti on the cellar floor. Satins and motor cars on this side, squalor and push carts on that. But for creative young people starting out especially, that was all that um, activity and the access in, of nearby very inexpensive food um, was quite appealing. And of course they fed on each other's company. Uh, it was a very heady time. In these years, in these pre-war years, we have the writers like Willa Cather, we have some of the muckrakers like Norris, Theodore Dreiser, who was known as, for such as his realist novels. Uh, and they all gathered in this spot. Among the most lively of them was John Reed. Reed was from Oregon. He had gone to Harvard. And after traveling around in Europe, he comes to settle and he comes to live on Washington Square. He writes a poem about his life <clears throat> I'm sorry. He said, but nobody questions your morals and nobody asks for the rent. Oh, life is a joy to a broth of a boy at 42 Washington Square. One of the other people living there was his, uh, he had some college roommates, was an older friend, Lincoln Steffens, who was uh, already an established journalist. After his wife died, he was encouraged to move down to uh, this part of Washington Square South. He had become friendly through his travels and work with uh, John Reed's father out in Oregon. And so it was encouraged that maybe he could keep an, an eye on uh, his father's son. Lincoln Steffen said he was amazed when he was out there, he said, that Greenwich Village, which had been a simple fact, a neglected neighborhood of low rents, became the dwelling place of students impecunious artists and down and out reds and the experimental laboratories for little theaters. This picturesque old quarter of the city was ridiculed and romanced into Greenwich Village, a sort of Latin quarter. Now, Reed went on to uh, work as a reporter. He would go off and post his dispatches on wars in various places. He became very involved in labor issues and helped uh, organize fundraising for the Patterson strike. And eventually he would write his reports to a magazine that was also very much of this time and culture. And that was called The Masses. And we'll look at a picture of The Masses right here. The Masses was founded to be um, a place that a, a magazine, a publication featuring fun, truth, beauty, realism, peace, feminism, and revolution. And John Reed's postings from the different wars where he reported uh, would always end with the line, 
this is not our war, which was then a, the a, a pacifist credo. Most of the artists and writers at this time, including Willa Cather, who was there, uh, would have been on the side of pacifism. The masses, the picture that you see there was also has, um, an illustration related to the Ludlow massacre that was taking place um, of miners out in Colorado. Uh, it was a massacre where 11 out of 25 people were killed, 11 of them were children. Um, one of the regular uh, artists who would sketch for the masses and a very important, um, one of the fundamental leaders of the publication was John Sloan. John Sloan was the, an artist who was a friend of Glacken's. He painted these uh, beautiful, we'd say realist kind of images of Washington Square and of, of the whole neighborhood of downtown. Um, he was all uh, very much um, a pacifist. He didn't have much help. He did, never was very successful with his art, um, but he, he kept trying. And in 1917, he was encouraged to go up by a young friend and a younger um, theater person in the area. Uh, she called herself poet, and that was Gertrude Drick. She liked to call herself Woe so that she could announce, Woe is me, very theatrical. And she had gathered a group, including John Sloan, and um, you can see on the left, or Maurice Duchamp. Marcel Duchamp had come over from Europe and was now living in New York and loved to be around all these lively people. Um, and he encouraged them to have that free spirit. There are some other people there who were members of the Provincetown Playhouse. And they, what happened was that Woe or Gertrude had found that the door of the arch was open one night. So she arranges to have a party and uh, the, this group who called themselves the Arch Conspirators found their way to the top of the arch on a very cold January night. Um, and once they got to the top, they declared themselves, they declared the succession, the secession of Greenwich Village from the America of big business and small minds. They called on President Wilson to recognize the free and independent Republic of Washington Square, and then pledged to serve the state of Greenwich and drank to her prosperity. Um, later on, there was a report to a Times reporter. They pretty much of the same thing. They vowed eternal constancy to aforementioned ideals of autonomy, a fic and then later affixed red, white, and blue balloons to the ramparts uh, and descended to ply our very callings till such time as the demands of state might again become imperative. Sloan, uh, later declared that this was his last bohemian activity. He stayed in the area. He rented a room at, in the tower of the Judson Church, which was rented out to bring money into the church. He stayed there and continued to paint for many, many years. He, the scene here on the right is typical of the kind of work he did, uh, beautiful creamy paint and a, a vision that we all know because Jefferson Market, like some of our other uh, old 19th century buildings have been, has been preserved, even though it's no longer a market and not a courthouse, um, but now is the library. Another artist who was living right across the way, who was not always as much involved in a lot of these activities was Edward Hopper. Um, Hopper who, um, was born in 1882 in, in Nyack, came to New York and thought he'd be able to make his living as an illustrator to well, uh, as well, but didn't have much luck. But he kept painting, he made prints, and he moved into a, a studio that had been built on the top of number three, Washington Square. You can see on the right, the one building where the cornice line rises way up. Uh, that would have been where Hopper's studio was. He lived in those rooms, in these two rooms, for many years. He hauled up his own call, coal all through his life. He was there until his death in 1966. He married Joe Nivison, another artist, and the two of them lived there. Their kitchen, you can't really tell here, is just that little area between 
the front room and the back room. And you can see the very large window for the excellent north light. You can see his easel. And in the other room, you can see his printing press. Now, if you're lucky, sometime you may hear about a visit that occasionally now it's taken over by NYU, but they do sometimes allow for special visitors and it's quite a thrill to be up there. But it's also a marvel that he stayed there or the two artists, not of easy temperaments, could stay there for their whole lives. And it would have been in that setting that Hopper painted early Sunday morning of 1930. Uh, no one knows exactly when, where this picture is set. Hopper had a way of collecting images and then kind of letting his memory pull them together in slightly different, with slightly different variations. Um, but it reminds us of some of the old buildings in the village and it's a very beautiful, uh, beautiful image. We know at this time that one of the few people who was interested in contemporary art was Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney. She had moved down to a studio on uh, McDougal um, Alley, and she would really welcome the artist. She helped them. She uh, had certain times where she'd have modeling sessions. She had gallery pl places where they could show their work, and she would occasionally buy their paintings. Um, Sloan sold his first painting to her, um, really when he was quite a bit older already, 1916. But they disagreed because um, Whitney, in comparison to the free-willing spirit that we see so true for most of the others who liked pacifism and, and feminism and so on, pacifism especially, uh, Gertrude Whitney was a staunch patriot. She raised money for the Allied cause in a wonderful alley festa right in that McDougal alley. Uh, nonetheless, she would have um, bought some of these paintings and including some of the works by Hopper. When she went to offer them to the Metropolitan Museum in 1930, just around the time this was done, they turned her down and so she decided she would open her own museum and that's the beginning of the Whitney Museum of American Art. Now, when we think about, <clears throat> sorry, when we think about Hopper um, and we look at this painting, you realize how still most of his pictures are. Let's just go back for a minute. You barely see a human being. They're occasionally there, but they're usually alone. Or even when they're together, it may seem like a lonely kind of scene. And when we see the view that he painted out the window, from his studio in Washington Square, there's not a soul in spot, nothing. November, Washington Square, 1930, he painted the rooftops, he painted other directions. You can see the, the dying tree, you can see the paths and the road, you can see Judson Church. But well, where are all the people that Glackens just enjoyed painting with such relish? Well, Hopper admitted that he had a hard trouble um, getting much success as an illustrator, because he said the publishers always wanted to have you show people waving their arms and moving around a lot, and he wasn't very good at that. And so it's a good thing eventually his painting started to sell and he was able to live his life out on Washington Square North. Now there are other artists who were part of this group too. Um, around by the 1920s and 30s, I'm skipping over all of Prohibition, which was a colorful time, all the development of the high-rise buildings. You can see one there in the back, uh, the number one Fifth Avenue. The west side of the park had also been the scene of development. Many of the smaller, very beautiful old townhouses made way for the high-rise. I think the first one was at um, there was one at 32 Washington Square that was quite early. And then the ones at either corner on 29 and 32 went up to before the first war, uh, you know, around this period of before the first world war, before the second world war, sorry. Um, at any rate, there were artists continue, who continued to come to the village. It was the place where you could live cheaply. There was the right spirit. There were uh, sympathetic people around. And this picture uh, by Thomas Hart Benton 
gives us one example of one of the reasons that the area was attractive. In the 1930s, uh, the artists who were trying to work, of course, uh, would have hit rock bottom. Like many others at the time, the depression had caused the great loss, a hemorrhaging of jobs, and who was going to pay for artwork? The government tried to step in. They established the WPA, which made work for artists, including Benton and one of his pupils, Jackson Pollock. A number of the artists who later emerged as major figures in the, 18, in the 1940s and 50s got their start and were able to get to know each other and form a community because of the WPA. The, the artists show, which still goes on twice a year around the Washington Square Park area, was begun at that point as a way to give artists a chance to sell their work. And it seemed to help along with other um, kinds of, of efforts that were going on at the time. The, you know, you can see the one who's making the picture of the woman who's sitting and someone else who's unwrapping. Um, Benton is often known as a, a regionalist. He went off into the, back to Kansas where he came from, but he was a teacher and he left his mark on Pollock by encouraging him and they were actually friends. What comes along now we'll see uh, after Benton um, with the coming of the artists who made it through the depression will be a whole emergence of a new school of painting, a group of artists who call themselves or were labeled abstract expressionists. Um, and that's going to be a very important part of the, of the park and of the scene down here. Meanwhile, in the 30s, the park was getting very heavy use. It was becoming shabby. We know that um, there were concerts, there were, um, there were barbershop quartets, there were glee clubs, there were all kinds of events taking place, folk dancing, and the park had been kind of shabby for a while. There were complaints about the park. Anyhow, it was uh, the lawns, the pavements were so cracked, um, the lawns were worn out, many of the plantings had seen better days. So it was becoming a kind of shabby place. Nonetheless, the abstract expressionists who walked through the park in the 40s were very happy to have that greenery. And they often would stop and rest there. This chance encounter at 3 a.m. Uh, shows de Kooning, who has that curl of white hair, sitting on a park bench. The story became known because de Kooning was interviewed in the 1970s, I believe, and Red Grooms heard about this incident and then decided to illustrate it. He said, and so on one night in the park, it was late, wasn't a soul around, thought I would sit on a little bit on a bench. I was sitting way on the right side of the bench and kind of a husky man was on the left end of the bench. And we just sat there until Mark said something like, nice evening, and we got to talk. I guess he must have asked me what I did. I said, I'm a painter. He said, oh, you're a painter? I'm a painter too. And he said, what's your name? I said, Bill de Kooning. Who are you? He said, I'm Rothko. I said, oh, for God's sake. And it was very funny. So this was Groom's chance to make a fun fantasy view of this encounter. You'll notice the arch in the background. You can see 2 Fifth now, which was completed in 1952. You can see the row house there on the right. And you can see the garbage bins. You can see Garibaldi. And you'll notice the muse with a laurel uh, over the head of these two artists. De Kooning had come from Holland, and like many artists, Rothko, actually born in Russia, had come from Oregon. Like many artists, they were congregating in New York, where they would soon be this constellation of artists that was very unusual and very rare, uh, gave the, the whole community and the art world a new, a new jolt. In this period, before the Second World War, there were many artists who were coming from Europe too to escape both persecution and, and the crackdowns that were going on, the infringements on their liberties. And so these artists from Europe were coming over and encouraging the younger avant-garde artists like Rothko and de Kooning and Pollock uh, 
And they really charged the scene and inspired the younger ones to pursue what they wanted, which was to paint abstract work that would somehow serve in a time that was so difficult uh, during the war, where how could you paint the human figure, as one of them said, uh, when we've had the Holocaust, when we've had Hiroshima. So this was a very, um, very exciting time to be in New York. Most of them were poor beyond belief. There weren't really the galleries, but they had a very close community. They would walk across the park from wherever it was they were living. There was the cafeteria on Sixth Avenue. There was the um, Cedar Tavern on um, University, just between 8th and 9th Street. There was a club that they formed and it was on 9th Street. So it was really the place where the art world was developing and modern art in America was really happening. At this time, we would have to say, and the artist would agree with it, that the art world was shifting from Paris to New York. And by 1950, New York really was the locus of modern art, and it has stayed that way ever since. And now we're going to take a slight detour and talk about other things that were happening at this time and had to have to do more with the shape of the park and the look of Washington Square. And this, of course, will have uh, meaning for us now. Um, we're very fortunate to have a park that has been redone, renovated so beautifully. But at the time, in the 1930s, as I said, the park was pretty scrappy. It wasn't necessarily a green or verdant or comfortable place to be. But in 1935, uh, a very powerful figure in the city decided to spring on the village, spring on this community, a new plan for Washington Square. It, the name was Robert Moses. Moses rose to power in 1924. Uh, he became a commissioner of parks for Long Island. He completed Jones Beach, Northern and Southern par Parkways. He never drove. He had a driver and a private car and driver. Yet he, before his career ended 44 years later, he had, it, built all the existing major highways, parkways, expressways, with the exception of the East Side Drive. He built the tunnels and the bridges that linked New York to the mainland. He created Lincoln Center and constructed hundreds of playgrounds in and out of the city. Now, Moses at, at one point was heading 12 offices, which civil service rules would have prevented him from doing, but he had a way of circumventing things. He was brilliant, ruthless, possessed of an iron will. He could be patronizing and mean, spirited, and he never forgot a slight. Well, when he encountered the villagers, they were not rolling over happily and saying, oh yes, please come build your park. They were up in arms. What Moses was suggesting, without consulting anyone down here, was what became known as the bath mat plan. You can see that nice kind of oval. And you can see Washington Square South. We're looking south now. Coming down from Fifth Avenue, you could uh, drive around the park either way, and then you would be able to access the three streets down south. The idea was that um, he wanted, that Moses wanted to do what Boss Tweed had wanted to do, and that is connect the north part of the park to the south, where he thought uh, there would be better business and it would uh, activate that part of the city. So what Moses put in, of course, was this roadway. And then you can see the greenery. And in the center, there was a reflecting pool. Uh, there were some playgrounds you can kind of just make out. But this was nothing like the Washington Square that people knew and loved. And there was no way, as a child coming across this park, if you'd been sent out to play or with companions or even with a caretaker, Look at the roads you'd have to cross in order to get into the park. So this plan was real, roundly criticized. He, he kept up the pressure to build this park and finally encountered such resistance that he wrote a letter to Mary Simcovich. Mary Simcovich was the founder of Greenwich House. He'd come to know her through some of his housing authority work. He asked her to read this at a public gathering for him. He wouldn't appear. 
He said, you will be glad to know that the reconstruction of Washington Square is going to be left to posterity. We plan only to restore and improve the square now without changing its basic character and design. There are all sorts of people around Washington Square, and they are full of ideas. There is no other section in the city where there are so many ideas per person and where ideas are so tenaciously maintained. Reconciling the points of view is too much for me. The filling in of Jones Beach or the building of the Triborough and, Tri and Henry Hudson Bridges are child's play in comparison. So round one of Robert Moses uh, is over. The local people are happy, the plan won't be done, maybe the park will be fixed up a little bit, the pavement and the lawns repaired and so on. But he will come back. What really angered people, and this is what Moses underestimated, was that he hadn't consulted them beforehand. And in this, he struck into a vein of that um, will become part of the village character, so to speak, uh, that he struck the vein of, of the spirit of activism. And so the local population very quickly would learn to be skeptical at the very least or critical of anything that the government or an authority would propose. Now, just to go back a little bit, and we'll talk a little more about the park plans. Um, in the, when the Potter's Field uh, was developed into um, parade ground, the field had been leveled and, and evened out. It was almost 10 acres. And the plan that was put down would have made sense for uh, the marching men for the militia training. And it, it formed a nice park almost as soon as that uh, parade ground was established. It was known as Washington Square Park. Um, you can see the 1827 plan, all the straight lines, and eventually coming into the center round where, um, you, as it shows there, and you can see those very strict lines, that strong geometry, when you look at the uh, that nice print by Bedeker of the parade ground in the 1850s. In 1871, however, the park was redone. It had become shabby again from overuse through the 50s, and just at the time that Central Park was going to be built, there were also concerns. Uh, William Cullen Bryant, who was one of the champions of the park, said that Washington Square was neglected as were many of the small parks in the city, and they needed attention. Well, a few years later, Boss Tweed sweeps into office, <clears throat> and he places his cronies at the heads of different departments. Uh, one William Kellogg is in charge of parks, and he comes out with a plan where, as you can see, now, now this one is set up so that Waverly Place is on the north, it's on the top, and the streets below at 4th Street, the three streets emerge there. Instead of that strict rectilinear design, we have some curves because the man designing this park had worked with Olmsted at Central Park. His name was Isnaz, Isnaz uh, Pilot, and he tried to incorporate some of these uh, curving sweeps and softer lines into the plan. You still have the north-south and you still have the uh, the horizontal line east-west. And you can see that the um, you would come straight through if you came down fifth, and you could very nicely enter uh, any of those other paths. Now, when you look at the picture on the right, and you look at that Colliers, you can see that was where the arch in 1871 hadn't been up yet, but Fifth Avenue came in, and it could have driven around the fountain, which was there, in the 1850s, could have gone around the fountain and could have come out on any one of the three streets that we know today. Well, LaGuardia was then known as Lawrence, there was Sullivan and Thompson Street. And you can see all the traffic. That was how the park was, and you can see those curving lines, and you can see where the children are playing. Now this park, uh, there was a lot of criticism when this park went up. There were uh, observers who would watch the men walk back and forth, uh, dragging dirt from one side to the other, and then drag that same dirt back and forth. And they felt that uh, this was just another example of um, Boss Tweed's largesse, that these men would be waiting to get a red shirt and a day's pay and allowed to go and vote early and often. 
Uh, there was a lot of corruption going on, but the park was finished and that design stood for a very long time. It didn't stay well, but that's the park that really survived. But that would not have satisfied, satisfied Moses. Moses could not give in. He could not leave Washington Square alone. He'd had such success everywhere else, and Washington Square is one of the only places in the city that vanquished him. In 1952, he came up with another idea, or at least uh, one of his designers did. Here he has, you can see coming down Fifth Avenue, you would cut through on major roadways 35 feet wide, going down in one direction, going up, going downtown, one, one, one of the roads, going uptown on the other. This is an elevation of the proposal, so you get an idea what it would look like. You can see the arch, and you can see how you would move from one side of the park to another. You could walk across the bridge to find the waiting pool. You could walk across the bridge and find your way to a playground. This is not normally how parks should function. Certainly would not have worked for children or families or for the kinds of activities we like to see happening in parks. But it was what Moses wanted um, for various reasons. He too wanted to push through that road that would bring traffic down Fifth and meet up with what he was hoping uh, to build his Lower Manhattan Expressway. That expressway and, and it's the way it would have cut through the village was stopped in large part by the activism of Jane Jacobs and many others. And we'll see that that activism is going to be uh, now a constant in the Washington Square area. Uh, the plan that you see on the left, the other, the first plan from 35 was known as the bathroom mat or the bath mat. This one was known as the big ditch. The community organized, and it took a number of years, but there were people here who said, this cannot happen. Shirley Hayes was a, a young mother with four boys. She used the park all the time. And she came up with what then was a revolutionary idea. She said, why should there be cars in the park at all? Why can't we eliminate cars? She and Edith Lyon uh, organized committees. They wrote letters, 16,000 letters. They signed petitions. And they were joined by another group, the Joint uh, Emergency Committee, with some very savvy people who knew how to work uh, public relations. And so uh, over a period of years, these people worked together. Ray Rubinow, certainly um, Jane Jacobs was part of this group. But joining this committee also was Eleanor Roosevelt, Margaret Mead, and a few other luminaries who would occasionally uh, write into the newspapers about how absurd uh, this plan of Moses was. Moses, of course, uh, must have only felt even more certain of the opinion he had reached in the 1930s about these people in the village who have so many ideas uh, and don't really uh, seem to know what they're talking about. We get an idea of the traffic and the level of traffic uh, from this very beautiful photograph by Andre Kertesz where he shows the, the marks in the snow, not only of all the people walking, but also the tracks of the cars going around and around. Uh, Kertes had come from Hungary and Paris and settled in number two Fifth Avenue where he made many, many beautiful photographs with a very powerful telescopic lens. He could look out at the arch and often has pictures of the whole square behind it. Uh, the event that takes place here and the last car through Washington Square finally happened in April 1958 um, when the, the pressure from the committees got to be too much and they won over the borough commissioner. And Moses' reaction was, there's something to be said for letting an unreasonable opposition have its way. Find out by experience that it doesn't work. How can you choke off all traffic in Washington Square? It is preposterous. But on October 23rd, the, the borough commissioner, October 23rd, 1958, ordered all vehicles out of the park, except for the buses and emergency traffic, for a trial of 30 to 60 days. 
there was no choking traffic, there was no problem, and finally the uh, park was closed to traffic permanently. For many years, buses could turn around at the arch, and you remember that Fifth Avenue was a two-way street, but eventually there were other routes that were found, and as we know now, this wonderful picture of the last car through Washington Square commemorates that very a uh, very splendid day when Washington Square really becomes the park that we know without traffic. Once the traffic was gone, the park also could welcome that many more protests. This is a Vietnam War protest from the 1960s. You can see folk singers around the fountain, also a photo from about 1960, and more and more of the demonstrations that like those that we've been seeing in recent times. In its almost two, nearly 200 year history, uh, Washington Square has really witnessed so much of New York and the country's history. In the evolution of the site, in its multiple roles, in the making of its monuments, and the efforts of loyal citizens to guard the park, Washington Square has been a remarkable laboratory for testing the principles of democracy. And probably that's as true now as it ever was. Thank you. That view on the bottom is of our new park. Very beautiful air view. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, the, you know, every time I see that image of the bath mat design plan, because you know, Washington Square has changed over time considerably but like its footprint hasn't, right? So, you know, that oval shape with the cars going around and the, you know, that would have been a very, very big change. And I think we would be in a bit of a different park um, had that plan gone through, but um, I love that one. Thank you. Um, so uh, right now I'm just checking the chat and the Q and A to see if there are any questions have gone through. Um, I did answer, someone was asking about the Triangle Fire site, um, and I just, um, you know, the address then and the address now are not the same. It's now called the Brown Building. It was the Ash Building, um, yes. and it's on the northwest corner of Washington Place and Green Street, so really right. It's one block off the square. Right. So. I'm sorry, um, I meant to, to indicate that. Thank you. No, no, that's okay. Um, and I'll just wait a second to see if any other questions come through. But um, for and those of you- There are plaques on the building. That yes. One is the national landmark, the other one is from the ILGWU, um, the bravery of the women and their forebears. Yes. Yes. And, um, and Emily, um, when you were talking about sometimes NYU will give access to get into the Hopper studio, um, maybe they let us in before and Emily gave a really lovely chat about Hopper. Maybe they will do that again once we are allowed to, uh, <laughs> once we are allowed to gather indoors in person. Right. Yes, um, we will try to get uh, that on the agenda. Um, it's been a while since we did that together as a group, so. Um, okay, it doesn't look like there's any questions. So um, I'll just let everyone who, first of all, thank you, Emily. Um, I really, really enjoyed actually getting to sit through that without having to get up. <laughs> that was oh, great. Good. Every time Emily has given this talk in the past, I, I can't sit, like I couldn't sit through all of it because I had to go do something else. So this was a real treat. Thank you. Um, and, you know, stay tuned on our uh, website and um, on the uh, emails. We have our next lunch lecture is actually this week. Um, I'm up to talk about the fountain. Um, it was requested after we had the talk on the arch. So I will be revisiting some of these topics that Emily touched on tonight. And uh, if there's any other topics that you're interested in for the lunch lectures, let us know. Um, we think we know what people enjoy, but we don't always. So. <laughs> it's so much more. And I feel always guilty that this is such a quick smattering of brushing over of so much wonderful history. We're lucky to live here and have the park. We really are. It's a it's a really amazing space, and I feel lucky to get to work for the Conservancy, which does so much to support it. So I thank Emily as both a volunteer of the Conservancy and a volunteer lecturer tonight, and all of you, some of our volunteers are here tonight as well. 
um, thank all of you and we'll see you next time. Stay tuned for the video. <laughs>